course, that's Jason. Um, just a very quick uh, history, because we do have a lot of coding to do, um, is that it started out as a no-named entity, and then Oleg Kislyov uh, got his hands on my 126 pages of notes about this no thing that had no name. He joined me. Um, a little while later, uh, Will Bird uh, joined me. And when Oleg uh, joined me, he, he called it Kanrin, which meant relation in Japanese. And then when Will joined me, he basically thought this was impossible to ever understand. I took that as a good sign and redesigned it basically right away. And, uh, and then he liked it. Um, and then uh, finally, um, Jason has joined. And in each case, uh, it's gotten better and better. And I think Jason has basically reached the, the ultimate. And Jason, why don't you uh, take over? All right. Well, we're pr implementing logic programming as a shallow embedding in a functional host language uh, racket uh, scheme relative. And we're implementing logic variables using those as uh, using rackets, the host language's numbers. So we'll define, we can tell if something's a variable, if it's in fact a number. And to turn a number into a variable requires some deep dark magic. Um, for those of you who don't speak Lisp, that's the identity function. And we're going to carry around uh, logic programming is the conjunction and disjunction, recursively defined conjunction and disjunction of equations. And as we try and figure out what it takes to satisfy these equations, we're going to keep a record of all the requirements we've had thus far so we can make sure that whatever new requirements we have on our solution are also copacetic with the pre-existing ones. And that record of information is called a substitution. It, you can think of it as an analogy to the environment uh, if you're writing uh, an, uh, in your functional programming language. But here, uh, think of it more like uh, you're solving a set of simultaneous equations. So when you solve a variable x, there might be a y or a z in the answer. Um, and so our substitutions might look something like we're implementing them as association lists. So variable zeros may be associated with variable one. Variable one itself might be associated with variable two. Variable two might be associated with, I don't know, cat. And that's, that's an association. And that's what our associations look like. And if I want to figure out what, uh, what zero means, I can look up the meaning in the substitution. This is a racket primitive for doing that. And uh, we got to give it the, the element we're looking up. Say, I want to find zero in here. And it'll give me back that pair, which isn't quite what I wanted. Firstly, I wanted not the pair, the association, but the thing it was associated with. And secondly, that's not what I wanted, because I wanted to drill in deep. I wanted, OK, if zero means the same as one, well, what does that mean? Two, well, what does that mean? I shouldn't have to keep asking these questions over and over again. So instead, we're going to use a, use a function called walk or find that drills down deep and gives us the, me the actual honest-to-goodness meaning of one of these terms in the substitution. And what it does is, given some term and a substitution, first, we ask if that thing is a variable. Because our associations are always mappings of variables to, to terms. That term may be a variable. It may be a constant. But if things we're looking up isn't a variable, then we're certainly not going to find it. Assume we find it, we, uh, we try and get, uh, assuming it's a variable, we try and find it. And because in racket, pairs are uh, truthy, anything that's not honest to goodness false is considered true. So if we get a non-false value, well, then we'll go ahead and look it up. Otherwise, will return the thing we were looking at. So one thing you might notice is 
with environments, you look something up, you actually can get an error message that says it's unbound. Here, you never get anything but some useful information. Very different, big difference. <clears throat> so we look, we try and find the value of zero, we dig all the way down and get it. If we try and find, uh, let's say, three in here, we'll just get back three because there's no information we have about it. Also, we try and look up uh, dog or something in there, we're not going to find anything there either. Now that we know how to look something up in one of these sub, uh, substitutions, we ought to know how to build one. And building it, in some sense, is the obvious extension. You know, I should remind you also that we, we do take questions. So if you have a, a quick question, just raise your hand or something, and I'll try to reach you. Um, so we're extending, we want to extend the existing substitution Suppose we've got some, um, the solution to equation. We can, make, we can solve this equation if we make variable x the same as term u. So we'll just add that requirement to our program and then carry on about our, uh, about our merry way. And we would extend that by just creating a longer list of the original one where we have the new pairing of x and u in front of the old pairing of s. And so we can take our old one, and we'll say, let's say, 3 has to be the same as dog in that substitution. Uh, oh, it adds the dot for me. There we go. And so we can. Uh, However, this also allows in some things we'd uh, be happier that if they weren't included. For instance, we don't do any circularity checks here, and that can allow infinite terms. For instance, we could make the variable 3 the same as the list that contains the variable 3. And if we did that, then 3 is the same as the list 3, which is the same as the list 3, which is the same as the list 3, which is an infinite list, and we prefer to exclude infinite terms. This is um, the list printing convention actually dotted with uh, You dotted probably with could term. demonstrate that. Do you want to demonstrate that real quick? Okay. Uh, three dot three two. Do a find. Oh. Just do a find. What do you want? Find three and the thing Okay, that works that too. Funny thing. Find three in what is this going to demonstrate? That it goes for a long time? No, it doesn't or, because oh, you have it in the background. No. If we tried to find the real complete meaning for this, one of the things that we're doing with our substitutions is we don't uh, oh, we don't right. encode them in a way that every term has exact, complete meaning. One of the reasons is that in doing so prevents the sort of situation Dan will be worried about. If I, have a, if I know that variable x means uh, the, uh, a tree of variable y and variable z, then we just return variable y and variable z. We don't recur into the terms. Um, and that makes the representation of the information we're mapping much shorter than it might otherwise be. You can imagine situations where if you had to update the entire substitution every time you find a variable meaning, then your term representation for certain terms might get exceptionally long. This is a way that saves space and it also I think makes it uh, somewhat simpler to understand how you add specific bits of meaning. Sure. No, conflicts, um, we can attempt to write equations that are unsatisfiable. We can, as is often the case in life, have desires that are just uh, physically or logically unattainable. And when that happens, we induce failure. We haven't seen how we're going to induce failure yet, but I'll show it to you immediately. Um, glad you asked. So. 
there's two situations where we might fail to add information. As it turns out, this isn't sufficient. We need to eliminate the ability uh, to add circularities. So we can't just willy-nilly add the, an, extend our substitution. We have to make sure that we forbid circularities. One way that we do that is by doing what's called the occurs check. First, we see if the variable x shows up somewhere in the term u. And if it does, then we fail. That was the example with the three inside the three list, the list of three. That's, that's an occurs check that will lead, lead to failure. And only if we, only in the situation where the variable we're trying to map to the term doesn't show up in the term, uh, do we extend. And, and the concept of the occurs check really showed up first in prologue a lot of years ago. And this is, this is, so, this is its definition for us. EQV just says that uh, two variables are the same, then returns true. So if the term that we're trying to add is a variable, well, they darn sure better not be the same. And we find the meaning of both pieces. For those of you who are not familiar with the Lisp language world, the cars and quitters are the left and right hand sides of a pair. But I like to think that you all do know about car and cutter. And otherwise, if it's not a variable and it's not a tree with children, then what we've got is that we're at a node that's a, it's a leaf node, and that node happens to be a constant. And since constants aren't the same as variables already, then we can just say it doesn't occur. And that's one of the ways we can fail to extend the substitution. The other way is if the two terms we're trying to equate don't unify. <coughs> Unification is, the implementation of unify is about, I don't know, uh, itself about a fifth of the number of lines we need to implement the whole system. And so unification over a language of binary trees with data at the leaves. Um, you can think of it as solving a deep equality predicate, but where you keep track of the information for differences. If we were asking, are these two trees equal, you just return yes or no. Here, we allow to, they're not equal yet. Well, they might be equal if we made a certain change. You, it's either no or if we do the following things, then they would be. Uh, the first line says that if I've got two atomic terms, two, two trees that uh, aren't pairs, then if they're already the same, we just return the original substitution. And that includes variables in this case. If, the, if they're not already the same, but the first term is a variable, then we go ahead and try and map, add an association, that variable to the second term. And that would make them the same, again, provided we don't have any circularities. Or in the opposite case, we recur, and uh, if the second one's a variable but the first one isn't, well, then we'll see if we can catch it the next time around. The interesting case, if we've got two trees that both have uh, left and right children, then we'll go ahead and try and see if we can make their left children all the same down the left side of the tree. And if we can do that, we'll produce some new proper, uh, potentially embiggened substitution. And then we try and make the right children the same in that bigger substitution. Presuming that we were successful, yeah. which is why the end is there. If this, if this comes out to, if this fails, then we can fail immediately. <coughs> and in the situation where they're not already the same, neither one of the two are variables so we can't add an association to make them the same. If we can't get it right by recursion, then we have an honest to goodness clash, as the gentleman in the third row suggested. Here's, a, here's the other place where we can't make them the same. Maybe one is cat, one is dog. 
or one is horse and the other's gold together with fish. Uh, if we have an honest to goodness clash that can't be resolved, then we fail. And that's our failure situation. So we could, let's see, unify uh, one dot two together with in the empty substitution. And that'll get us back. Well, those two terms are the same if one means the same as cat means and two means the same as cat means. Likewise, these two terms are the same if one means the same as cat means and two means the same as cat means. Because we said that one has to be the same as what's in this position. And two has to be the same as one, which we already asserted was cat. All right, and so we can uh, implement the first of it. And there's only four to five operators in the language. We're ready to implement the first of them. And this is, uh, they define, we define it as uh, equal, equal. This is our equation. And this I as the programmer in this language so want to say that these two term that two terms have to be equal relative to the information we're keeping around. U and V, and we'll just start off with uh, substitution S Dan. S is good. Um, so you need to say a few words that uh, that this is a curried function. Oh yeah. Um, but that's all it is. We're just currying the lambda s right into the syntax. And this is a, a trick that MIT Scheme had a few years ago. And we've adopted it as, as has Racket, which is the language uh, that we're implementing uh, the code in today. All right, so I, as the language writer, give the two terms. And then under the hood, our implementation pipes through the substitution. Those of you who like the word monad can find out where to place that here. So we'll uh, let S be the substitution we get back, our new and big in substitution, be the result of calling unify on. You use that word in big in, but what we really mean is potentially larger. Right. It doesn't always grow, right? Because we said in one of the cases, we just return S. Okay? But Metaphorically, you are thinking that when you do unify two terms, you're getting uh, more information. And that's what substitutions are. They're pieces of information, and now you've got more. And you haven't violated the, the, the views that you have at this moment in time. And so the result of unify is either a new potentially embiggened substitution or failure, if we could make it work or we couldn't. So if we get some non-false answer back, then we'll return a list with, uh, that contains the one answer we were able to achieve. And otherwise, we return an empty list of no answers. It'd be hard to miss that this is you know, based on the kind of list monad that you've probably yeah. have seen uh, sometime along. In your so career. coming up is non-determinism. When we add disjunction, we'll be able to, uh, the way to solve either of two problems is the way we solve the first one and then the ways we solve the second one. And we'll move on from there. But there you can see where the list monad is, uh, or non-determinism is hanging out. But you don't need to know anything about monads. I love when Phil Wadler would give these talks and say, oh, you don't need to know any category theory. That was always nice. <laughs> but it was all about category theory, of course. All right. Um, so we can give this a whirl, or I think so. Just give, it, give it a couple of a couple examples, and you'll get a sense of what the Unify is buying for us. And this ought to return a procedure. Oh no! You have equal, to give equal. it a substitution. I got to give it oh, equal equal here. Equal, yeah. 
And that ought to return a procedure because it's waiting. Remember, that's the lambda s that got We know for out. a substitution. <clears throat> and we give it a substitution. Uh, we get back a list of answers. That list of answers uh, is itself a list that contains one pair, the association of variable 2 to variable 1. So several things about this are somewhat uh, uh, less, than we'd, less than we'd prefer to have. The first of which is I don't like programming where my variables are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's rather cumbersome. Try and write a program where you need 158 variables and then ask yourself again what the 90th one was. Instead, we're going to be able to piggyback on hop top of our host's lexical scope, uh, in their lexical variables to implement our logic variables. So what I'd like to do, rather than having to write uh, some sort of an equation like that, I'd like to create a variable and say, let's say the variable x has to be the same as dog. I'd like to be able to write my own x, y, z logic variables and use those. And so we're going to use the host language's lambda with an operator call with fresh that's going to scope this variable and pass along the logic, pipe the logic variable under the hood. That's the, that's the behavior that we're going to use to get a hold of lexical variables. So it's going to take an f, a function like this, And then we're going to give it some sort of a state, and we'll continue from there. Now, the, we didn't mention this at the time, but one of the good reasons to use numbers as logic variables is we want every time we create a new, uh, new one of these logic variables to guarantee that it's different from all the previous ones. We'd like to functionally know how to create a new one, and we'd like to make sure that we always have another one available. And numbers have this nice property that uh, if I start at zero and increment when I need a new one, I'll know exactly how many I've used and what the next one is. And we need to carry that information around with us. So the easiest way to do that is to carry it to not just a substitution, but a substitution together with that counter, which requires changing our implementation of, unify of equal equal just a little. And that means here we'll return a state that has that new s together with the, the original counter. Rather than just plumbing through a substitution, we now plumb through a pair of a substitution and that counter. And again, the reason we need that counter is so that we can get a hold of it when we want a new variable. And so a function, a function like one of these f's, it's expecting an honest to goodness logic variable. And, we give it a, and when we get a, give it a logic variable, it returns one of these sorts of things, one of these goals that's waiting for a state that is a substitution and a counter. So we need to give the goal that we get back here a substitution and a counter. So we can give it the original substitution that we had with us, and an incremented counter. And if we give this goal the counter, then what we get back is a list of answers, either right now one or none of them. So call with fresh. See, lambda x equal equal x to cat. And we'll call this with a state, the empty substitution together with the counter zero. <coughs> and now you want to describe the details of these parentheses, please? Sure. This is a list of answers. 
and this is a single answer, a state, and that state contains a substitution, which is a list of these pairs, dotting variables to, ve uh, to terms, together with a next variable counter. We use the variable zero and associate that with the term cat, and we know the next variable that we're going to use is variable one. And it's also a little annoying to have to start up using, uh, writing that state out every time. So we'll define init state to be the infinity list together with zero. All right, and that's, we can right now create as many variables as we want and set up one big giant equation and solve it and figure out what the information is and whether it works or doesn't. And that's kind of cool. But logic programming is about uh, getting choices. Dan? What do you want to say? Where are we going next? Well, we're obviously going to go to a choice operator. Let's call it um, dish. Would that be all right? And Dish takes two goal goals. Okay, now they look simple, right? They're equal, equal, this to this is one goal. And how do we recognize a goal? Because it's an expression whose value is a function that takes a state. That's what a goal is. And it returns a list of states. I'm using the word list loosely right now. A list of states. Okay, we'll make it less loose. All right. Okay, I promise. So there it is. There's the call to dish g1, g2, which returns a function expecting a state. So goals are state to list transformation. All right. And so the way we solve these is by solving each one individually. Just apply the goal to each, and now we have two lists, guaranteed, two lists, or maybe two failures, who knows. But um, two lists, <coughs> and we just append them together. Now, I assume everybody knows append, but if not, you have two lists, and you just remove the parentheses in the middle, and you've got an append, okay? And now we just write a pen here. Very simple. And Couldn't be simpler, right? And now we have a pen. That's the operational definition of remove the parentheses in the middle. That's it, right there. OK. So <coughs> it probably would be a good idea to demonstrate this at this All right. point. Um, so let's see. Dish of, we'll say, you could do this one or Let's do something so we can clearly tell the difference. How about x to dog? <coughs> oh, well, probably be good to do something where you can tell the difference. It'd be a different x. Well, maybe. OK. All right, so <coughs> you see the two answers. Is that true? Mm-hmm. I can't see the board well enough. All right. Okay. Oh, I see. There it is. Okay. And there they be. Mm -hmm. The one answer where we've extended the substitution and created a new variable, and the other where we have it. Conjunction is similarly defined. We have binary disjunction, also binary conjunction. 
And the way we solve the conjunction of two goals is solve the first one. And this returns uh, pr presumably a list of answers. And since it returns a list of answers, what we want to do is we want to run the second goal over each one of those answers. And, and remember, even when it fails, it's still a list of answers. It's just the empty list of answers. And this is, if you know what, our good old append map function. Now, just in case you're wondering about this funny <coughs> dollar sign business every day, that's because we know that it's always a list. And later on, we will change what that means. But for now, we know it's always a list. So in the case where we have a non-empty list of answers, well, we need to compute the recursion. And this returns a list of answers. And we know that running a goal on a state returns a list of answers. And so we need some way to combine these two lists of answers and get back a list of answers. If only we had such a function that could do that. Takes two lists of answers and returns one list of answers. Any thoughts on what that might be? I have one. What would you like? The only one we've got, right? A pen. <coughs> so now at this point, we have both conjunction and disjunction. We have equal, equal. And we're actually missing one more piece of information. How on earth are we going to get anything done? Right? How are we going to do anything interesting? Yeah, this, is, this works perfectly well. Uh, this implements depth-first search and works perfectly well over finite search trees. Depth-first search is, in point of fact, complete over finite search trees. It's only when you have uh, infinitely deep search branches, a la searches that we built with recursion, where depth-first search can go into a hole it can never get out of. Is this going to work well with recursion, Jason? Um, it'll go mighty quickly. Well, let's see. Let's see what you got. Um, so we'll define one. How about define something holds to something we'll call it unproductive if it's if the recursion holds. Aptly named, not very useful. Oh, but it's so useful. This is the kind of thing I'd like to write write as a relation. Or how about if you have this in mind, let's do. God bless you, whoever you are. So x is either equal to cat or we're going to recur for more. This is the kind of thing I'd like to, uh, like to write to implement to ask for infinitely many cats. Wait, wait. You, you didn't test unproductive. No, I didn't. Does everyone know what unproductive returns? No. Nothing. It goes on forever, right? That's not very productive. But this <coughs> one has a chance because one of them is. Well, well because this one goes into an infinite loop just as badly. We solve a disjunction by getting the results of both answers and then appending them together. So for the first disjunct, that's not bad. We know how to do that. That returns a list of one answer. The second one returns never. And if you're waiting for the, uh, for the result of an infinite recursion before doing some action, you're going to be waiting quite a while. So there's the, pr the problem is when we're doing, building these recursions. And I'd like to. Rather than recurring some part of the way, let's stop it right in its tracks. And here's a, a shorthand way of doing it. We'll add some new syntax. So we'll this say rather than using define, macro. we'll call it define relation. And it's going to take a name together with some arguments and then a goal. 
And instead, when we, and when we see a pattern like this, Racket's going to understand that this should be written as define name.args together with a function that's going to take a substitution. And when it does that, I'm going to just use the word delay here, Dan. We're going to delay. And we can change our implementation of that later if we decide to. And so we're going to delay the evaluation of the goal on that state. So rather than computing a recursion, we return a delay immediately. We return a promise, which means that we now no longer go into an infinite loop here. Instead, we stop instantaneously, which is great, except that uh, our append, uh, our dollar append doesn't know how, what to do with the promise. It knows what to do if it gets an empty list or a list with at least one thing in it, but it doesn't know what to do if we return a promise. So we'll have to tell it what to do in the case when we get a promise. If we return a promise, we are going to, well, because we are, uh, this thing is a promise, we want to make sure what we do, the result of dollar $pen doesn't go into an infinite loop. So we'll also delay the res delay here. And what we're going to do is we're going to delay We'll return a delay, which when we invoke it, continues the work right where we left off. Sort of like a coroutine, right? For those of you who are old enough to remember such terms. And we can do a similar thing in the uh, conjunction case, because conjunction also doesn't know what to do in the case that we have a promise. That has to be something G, else. G, and it's got to be a dollar. Right, but you need to add the hyphen map. Do what? You need to hi add, I think, the hyphen map. Again? Yes. Uh, yes. So, so this that's one, a straightforward recursion. This likewise carries on right where we left off. And two little tiny changes. Oh, well, so we also the, ought to make this define relation. Yeah, fine. Two little tiny changes to a pen and a pen map. And we've almost got the entire system. There's a, one more little hitch we've got to deal with. So we return a promise, which we can then force. And we get back an answer and together promise. with a promise for more. So we we'll get, the, get the promise for more. Does anybody recognize this data structure now? And go we'll force that. Starts with the letter S. <coughs> of course, it's a string. And what we're noticing is it's cats all the way down. So that clearly should have been called turtles. Or All right, and so this, this seems to work. We can get multiple, uh, as many answers as we want out. And so long as we're getting them one at a time, there's no problem with, uh, with this infinite recursion because we always have to push the button for however many we want. Let's say we wanted to get, uh, I like cats, but I also like turtles. You didn't change your definition of cats by any chance, did you? Do what? Did you change your definition of cats? Um, no, I left it the same as it was. OK. Good. OK. And 
I do need to load the file. So we run this, I'll get a turtle, and if we run it for one more answer, we'll also get turtles and turtles and turtles and turtles all the way down. The reason being is that it's exactly what we said and nobody stopped us when we did it. What happens to combine these two potentially infinite streams together is when we reach a promise, when we find a delay in one, well, then we continue right where we left off. Right where we left off. Getting infinitely many more of those cats and uh, turtles and never do we get to the cats. So the solution, going from a depth first search that we've now made uh, work in a, uh, shout in a uh, strict host to an interleaving depth first search that turns it into a complete search is to wait for it, switch those two answers. Now, when we hit a, recur hit a delay, we instead let the other guy go. And because we do this at every choice point, it, this turns out to be, implement a complete search, guaranteed complete by construction, based on the program that we're writing. Now, it's not depth first search or uh, iterative deepening depth first search, any of the particular search strategies you know of, necessarily. Uh, but it is guaranteed to be complete, and this is the least amount that you can require for an arbitrary program to guarantee that you'll get a complete search. And now it's, it's officially the entire well, implementation. Is well, it Dan, not? this is, I'm also rather annoyed at this. Oh, the force, oh, well, you can get rid of that with a... Let's do that. A simple, so, a simple take of some kind, right? Yeah, something like that. So... Two things. Um, it's awful knowing to have to force, 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 because it maybe it takes multiple steps to finally get to some sort of an honest to goodness answer. We could be having to push on a promise for a while. So, or pull on a promise. This is called hide the representation, right? If what we've got is a promise, then we'll pull on forcing the promise. Otherwise, if we have something that's either the empty list or a list with a real answer, then we'll just return that answer. And what do you say we pull, uh, we grab the definition of take and also add that in? So we're throwing in now this definition, which is very simple. It simply says you give us uh, a number and you give us a stream because it now really is a stream, and we'll give you the first n elements out of the stream if there are that many answers. But if there aren't that many answers, then it will give you less, never more, right? For those of you who haven't had your coffee, go ahead. All right, so let's make sure we've loaded it. Now I can ask this for Take the first three answers out of, well, let's pull on it. And then take the first three answers off of that. And we'll get turtles, cats, turtles. And now we get a, an interleaving search. And this is sufficient to do logic programming. Um, the classic logic programming 101 example is, is a pen. And append is neat in logic programming. One of the benefits of this is that we can write, rather than append function that takes two inputs and produces an output, or if I wanted to find all the ways to concatenate two lists together to produce it, I have to write a second function that takes the list A, B, C, D, E and produces the uh, a two by n matrix of answers that says the list A together with B, C, D, E, and then the list A, B together with C, D, E, Etc. All If I want to produce all the ways, I can combine two lists together to produce the initial one. But if we describe things relationally, then we can write one function, so to speak, that we can use in any of these different modes to get the answers we're after. And this is sufficient to do that kind of programming. Now, it's not necessarily the, uh, the language you want to program in, 
But I assert this is probably the language you'd want to compile down to. And the compiling down is simply very trivial one or two line macros. And there's, I think, six or seven of them. It's not big. Mm. And let me just pause for a moment and give you a little bit of a, uh, an advertisement. Uh, the reason the Gamer came out in 2005, and um, the reason Gamer's uh, new edition, I don't know what exact title it will be, will be coming out relatively soon, I hope, and it will have virtually the same code, including all the macros that make it Mini Canman. So that's uh, something to look forward to, I hope. All right, so do we have time to write a pinda? Can you uh, pull one out of the water? No. No. That was cheesy. Oh. Well, in that case, I want to watch. It's really tricky the first time. <laughs> Define relation. Yeah, I think that would be the So first this is, thing. we're implementing it as a disjunction where either two things have to be the case. Either L has to be the same uh, as the empty list, and S has to be the same as the output, or this, this is our first case. When the first list is empty, the second third have to be the same. Otherwise, well, we'll posit two fresh variables. Well, Jason's busy. Uh, typing. I would like for you to know that there have been 50 implementations of micro Canron since it first came out on what, some 35 or so uh, languages? Yeah. 35 or so languages. It's all available on uh, minicanron.org. But the temptation should be really strong that you want to do it on your own favorite language that you use as your go to language when you're in a hurry. And if you, have, you write in a functional programming language that provides closures, conditionals, constants, numbers, uh, higher order functions, and garbage collection, I can show you how to write one of these in your own favorite language. So if you're working on a day-to-day -day basis and need some logic programming, you can bust one out right quick, solve your logic programming, and go back to your functional language. Didn't, didn't you just ask a student recently to do one in JavaScript? Yeah. And how? What's that? You have also done it. Yes, of course. But we wanted to see if a student could do it. <laughs> That's what teachers do, right? <laughs> you, you have to keep exploring the, the, the life and the, the brain of the student with them. All right, so. Either the first list has to be empty and the second has to be the same as the third, or given the posit the existence of two variables a and d such that the first list is the same as the pair of a and d, and then posit another variable so that the output is the first L, the car of the first list together with this r, that's the output, and the recursion is itself an appendage. So call, let's see, with initial. What do we call we it? We want to wrap it in a take, so. Call with initial state? Yeah, sure. How many do we want? I don't know. Six, seven. OK. Oh, boy. All right, let's do it. So take six of, oh, no, uh, call with initial state will do that for me. Initial state. Doesn't matter. Of yeah. six, and let's call fresh. Lambda x. X. Y. Z. And we'll say appendo x, y, z. All the and answers. those are the answers. And that's six ways you can append lists together and get, uh, or we can do about, let's see, A, B, C together with 
DE. And if we add some pretty printing on top of this, they come out looking exactly like the lists A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But that's in approximately 50 lines of code, logic programming sufficient to a pin list together, and it turns out under some assumptions this is enough to generate quines too. Yeah. Now I do want to say a couple words <coughs> in case you don't happen to have all the fancy tools that Racket has. Lambda nil will do yourself fine for delay, and invoking one of those will take care of force. And that's really all you need, except then you have to ask procedure question mark instead of promise question mark if you happen to be in a scheme. Or you can put a tag on the thing and check to see if a tag is whatever it happens to be uh, for arbitrary uh, thunks, functions of no arguments. So you don't really need all the fancy tools. And, um, and you may not want to be writing programs in, in Racket. So this is, that's how simple this is. It didn't start out simple, trust me. <laughs> it really didn't, but now it has become, uh, due to the great work of, of Jason, very, very simple. Um, anything else um, before we go to questions? Or no, I think just, that's pretty much or, it. Or have we just gone to questions? <laughs> Okay. okay. Questions. I don't think we have time for questions. Oh, was the I statement. don't think. Oh, I heard the last three words I heard were time for questions. The first three words were I don't think. Oh, I missed those. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>